Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about stall and specifically super stall or deep stall. I'm going to tell you five different things that you need to know about this subject. Make sure you stay tuned. Wind 31016, everyone right, right on. Third line, 31 right. Delta T60. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, I don't know if you are the kind of person who makes huge New Year's resolutions. Me, myself, I try to aim at getting a little bit better every day, okay? A little bit small increments in knowledge every single day. And this is where Brilliant.org really is useful too. If you use this link here below, you'll get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant and they have an app, a website and over 60 different courses in order to help you improve in a really, really interactive and fun way in the areas of maths, computer science, physics and it's really, really good. So check it out. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about stalls and specifically super stall. So the first thing we're going to do, step one, is to actually define what a stall is. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you have seen a stall in real life. If you were a kid and you had a paper airplane and you threw it and you saw how it kind of slowed down and as it did so, it turned the nose down and then it gained speed again, continued to fly and it did so a couple of times, what you're seeing as the aircraft, in this case the, uh, the paper aircraft, kind of slows down and falls, that last part, that's the stall. Um, so the way that wings are built is that the airflow is coming in towards the wing at a certain, what we call, angle of attack. Uh, the wind, the air, is supposed to flow both on the underside of the wing and then follow the slightly curved overside of the wing. And as long as it does so, it will be producing lift. Now, if we, for example, want to slow the aircraft down and we want to maintain the same lift from the wings and maintain the same altitude, we can only do so by pitching up the aircraft. So increasing the angle of attack that the wing is producing. And this is fine. The problem is, though, that as we increase the angle of attack, when we start to reach a certain point, the air will not be able to follow the curve of the wing anymore, and it will start to kind of release. And when that happens, that's the critical angle of attack, that's when the aircraft starts stalling. And if you, from that point, continue to pull back, to continue to increase the angle of attack, the amount of lift that the wing will be able to take out will decrease dramatically and the drag from the wing is going to increase. And that's because the, uh, the wing goes from being a wing until basically a barn door. You know, the air will hit it and afterwards it will just be a huge wake with turbulence. So we don't want this to happen. Okay, uh, stalling an aircraft is something that we are trained to try to avoid at all costs. Because as you do, you lose uh, essential controls of the aircraft. The aircraft will not be able to continue to, to fly and it will essentially start falling down. Now, most aircraft are built in the way like that paper airplane. So that as the stall happens, the nose will automatically drop and it will start regaining some speed. The angle of attack will go down, providing that we add thrust it will then continue to fly. Okay, that's the idea, anyway. So what do we, the pilots, do then if we encounter a stall? So this is point number two. Well, the most important thing and the first thing that we have to do is decrease the angle of attack. Because remember, a stall can happen at any airspeed and at any kind of attitude. If you have a really, really high speed, you can actually fly the aircraft straight up, vertically, okay? But you have to be able to maintain the speed in that case. Subsequently, you could also be in a dive and stall the aircraft if the speed is not high enough. So it doesn't really matter the attitude. The angle of attack is what's important. And in any case where you have a stall, you need to decrease the angle of attack. So you do that by pushing the nose forward, unloading the wing, decreasing the angle of attack. Okay? Now, 
on a modern aircraft, we have loads of indications that helps us from getting into a, uh, a stall in the first place. We get, you know, we get the pitch limit indicators on the primary flight display showing that we are closing in on the critical angle of attack. Um, some aircraft have an angle of attack indicator as well. Then we have oral warning saying, you know, speed low speed low for example we have the speed box starting to flash to show us that we're getting into a bad area and then at the very end before the aircraft stalls we get either buffeting that's when we actually feel in the aircraft in the body of the aircraft that um, those that turbulence is starting to come off the wings so the aircraft is shaking or the stick shake Now, whatever comes first of those two, so either the buffeting or the stick shaker, we need to immediately react. Because the aircraft is not in a full stall then, it's just approaching a stall. And we do so by lowering the nose. Okay, that's the most important thing. Get the aircraft wings level if it isn't, lower the nose as you do so, make sure the speed brake is down, and then carefully add thrust. And I'm saying carefully, that's because I'm flying the 737. And on the 737 you have undermounted engines. And what happens if you add thrust on an undermounted engine? Yes, it starts pitching the aircraft up. And of course, if you're in a situation where the nose is too high already, you add thrust then, and the nose keeps pitching up further, you might actually aggravate the stall. The st stall might get worse and you might not get the nose down. So the most important thing is get the nose down, use stabilizer trim if you need to, but make sure you don't use too much. And then as the wing is down, start adding thrust and remember that as you do, you're gonna have to push a little bit further in order to keep that nose down, keep building speed and do not try to regain the altitude until you are back above the up speed in the 737 if you're flying with no flaps or the minimum maneuver speed for the flap setting that you're at. Okay? Now, some people will ask, well, what if you're close to the ground then? But the fact is that you need to unstall the wing. Okay? If you're close to the ground, you still need to unstall the wing because otherwise you will hit that ground. So, initially, do that. And if it turns into a terrain escape maneuver, so you get a, um, you know, terrain, terrain, pull up, warning from the ground proximity warning system, well then you're going to have to revert to the, um, to the terrain escape maneuver. But that's a really, really bad day. In any cases, you need to unstall the wing before the aircraft can continue to fly. Okay, so step number three then. Let's talk about super stall. Now, as I mentioned in, in step number two, most aircraft are built for it to automatically lower the nose. Okay, in case of a stall, if, it, if you would not touch anything, you just let it be, the aircraft would stall, pitch down, regain some of the speed, just like that paper airplane we were talking about. However, there are certain aircraft designs that will not do that. And these aircraft designs have swept wings, we'll get to that in a second, and they tend to have T-tails. Right? That means that the elevator is situated on top of the um, vertical stabilizer because, for example, they have engines mounted at the back. Now, the fact that the engines are mounted at the back has nothing to do with the aerodynamic characteristics of a super stall, but it tends to be that way. So, why swept wings? Well, the way that the swept wing is designed um, and the way that aerodynamics works is that with a swept wing, you will not have the air flying straight over the, the wings. It will actually start to kind of slip out towards the wing tips, spanwise flow. And when that happens, because of that, you tend to have a higher angle of attack towards the wing tips than towards the roots of the wings. So as you're increasing the angle of attack, the uh, wing will start to stall at the wing tips, which is where you have your ailerons. Now, when it does that, when it starts to, to stall at the wing tips, remember that the, the swept wings are like this, it's like an arrow. That means that the total amount of lift that the wings produces are normally, in normal flight, set as a, at a specific point that is slightly behind the center of gravity. Okay, so slightly behind the center of gravity, so it's pushing the nose down, and then you have the elevator towards the back, 
that is has downward lift to push the nose up and they are in the equilibrium okay now this is why i keep telling you that you need to use uh, brilliant.org to understand the physics behind things like aerodynamics but this is the case anyway and if, that, if that's the case if you have the center of lift situated behind the center of gravity when it's in normal unstalled flight and then you start to stall the wings at the wingtips remember that v-shape that means that the lift the center of lift as the aircraft starts stalling is going to move closer and closer to the center of gravity so the momentum arm that it has is going to be smaller and smaller however the momentum arm of the um, of the elevator is staying the same so if you have a smaller force that's pushing the nose down than the force that's pushing the nose up what will happen the aircraft will start pitching up and this is what's happening okay so with a swept wing aircraft as it starts to stall the nose will start moving upwards which will increase the angle of attack which will aggravate the stall which will further move the center of lift which will then further move the nose up now you're starting to see the problem okay but we haven't gotten to the worst problem yet as this wing is now stalling it's creating a wake behind it. Remember how the air was kind of letting go of the top of the wing? And when it does so, it creates a turbulent air layer, a wake behind the wing. And because the nose of the aircraft is getting higher and higher, the tail, which has the elevator on it, it's getting lower and lower. And at a certain angle of attack, when the nose is high enough, when the angle of attack is high enough, the aircraft is stalled enough, the wake will completely go over the elevator and stall the elevator, all right? So this means that if you're getting to this angle of attack, the nose is up there and you try to push forward in order to reduce your angle of attack, nothing will happen. The aircraft is now in a stable stall, a deep stall or what we call a super stall. And it is almost nothing that we as a pilot can do to get out of this. The aircraft will keep being stalled and will basically fly like a leaf down towards the ground, like that, right? So that's a terrible condition. The only way to really get out of that is to try to get a wing to drop. That could be done by, maybe you have a little bit of aileron uh, authority still in it, but remember, the wing tips are the things that stalls first, and that's where you have your ailerons. You might also be able to use a bit of rudder. Unfortunately, the rudder is also in that kind of disturbed air, so it might not be effective in order to get kind of the wing to fall down. When you get the wing to fall down, the nose will come down as well, and you might get out of it. And engines, unfortunately, are also in that area since you have the rear mounted engines they are now in the disturbed airflow so you can get things like compressor stalls so this is a very very bad situation now number four what kind of design features do we have on aircraft in order to keep this from happening well we have many so on the aircraft types that are um, kind of sensitive to super stalls, that would be the Fokker 28, the MD-80, the DC-9, the, um, the Back 111, which is where actually this phenomenon was first encountered back in 1963, uh, and also some of the, the propeller aircraft like the ATR-72, for example. When you have a, an aircraft like that, you will see that there's a lot of design features on the wings to keep that flow-wise span from happening. So that things like uh, wing fences, for example, those are essentially metallic strips that you can find at different intervals down the wing, which will physically stop the air from slipping down the wing and just keeping it in the uh, in kind of the way that it's supposed to flow. Uh, you have things like jagged leading edges. Uh, you have also something called a stall strip, which is a metallic strip you can see uh, near the wing roots, which effectively makes the angle of attack higher towards the wing root and by doing so, you create a condition where the stall start at the wing root rather than at the, um, um, at the wing tip. Okay? And you also have things like vortex generators. Now, vortex generators are installed on aircraft that are not prone to super stalls as well. Because what they do is they, they create a little bit of drag, but they also create a very high energy turbulent layer, which forces the air to, instead of just releasing from the wing and create the stall, 
it actually, because of the higher energy that it has, this turbulent air, it follows the wing further. So it lowers the stall speed and it improves the um, handling characteristics over rudder surfaces, for example. You can also have things like Kruger flaps, which has a similar, um, similar kind of effect as a stall strip and it also improves the, uh, the, the low speed characteristics of the aircraft, but these are some of them. But step number five that you need to know about is the stick pusher. Now you might have heard of the stick pusher system. Um, it is not the same as a stick shaker. So in aircraft like the one I'm flying, the 737, we don't have a stick pusher, we have a stick shaker, which is there just to kind of let us know uh, that we are approaching the, the stall speed, but it still lets us, the pilots, handle it. Now, the stick pusher is there on these type of aircraft that are prone to super stall to make sure that they never, ever, ever get into the angle of attack needed for a super stall. So typically when you have a stick pusher, you will have a stall warning first. So before you reach that critical angle of attack, there will be a stall warning that will enable the pilots to kind of lower the nose by themselves and get out of the stall conditions. But if the pilots do nothing, well then this stick pusher is an actual physical push that pushes the yoke forward and forces the nose down so that it reduces the angle of attack in before we get to the, uh, the, the super stall. So this is a good system. However, of course, it's not completely flawless. There are conditions where a stick pusher could be activated by mistake. And that would be, for example, faulty airspeed indications or angle of attack indicators that doesn't work. And if you have a system like that, the stick shaker is made so that the pilot can actually overrule it by physical force if it you know, activates where it shouldn't. And you can also, if you know about a failure like this, if you're following the checklist, there will be a deactivation switch that deactivates the, um, the stick pusher. But if you do so, in most cases, once you have deactivated it, you cannot activate it until you're down on the ground again. It's also uh, normally, the, the way that the logic works is that during uh, low speed flight conditions, like in, during takeoff and landing, if the aircraft knows that it's in a takeoff or landing configuration, it will also automatically keep the, uh, the stick pusher from activating. But the stick pusher is there on these type of aircraft to keep them from ever getting into a super stall because a super stall is a potentially very dangerous situation that might require a lot of altitude to get out of if you ever get out of it. That's it guys. Now, as you have noticed throughout this episode, we talk a lot about uh, momentum arms, about aerodynamics, about physics in general. And this is why I am so happy to have Brilliant.org as a sponsor to this episode. Because I know that if you want to improve on your just fundamental math skills, or your physics skills, or your computer science skills, well, Brilliant.org has all the tools available to do so in a fun and interactive way. Okay? So, for example, one uh, course that I find really fascinating is a new course that they've just come out with uh, about um, algorithms. The, the likelihood is that you're watching this video because the YouTube algorithm has figured out that you like aviation videos or that you're a curious person. So how do they actually make these algorithms? Well, go into Brilliant.org, check out the course on how the computer scientists think when they create algorithm. And they've done so in a way that you don't need to be a computer scientist to understand. You can be any person. As always, with the courses in Brilliant, they will kind of take a problem and they will break it down into smaller pieces that are easy to understand. And as you understand those smaller pieces, you will also understand the bigger picture. So use this link below, 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant, and I guarantee you that you will like it. Now... After this video is finished, those of you are, who are still here, I will have a quiz for you. So I will have a quiz on these five steps that I've just explained to you on mentorpilot.com slash quizzes. And I would love to hear how you're doing. So after you've done the quiz, come into the Mentor Aviation app and tell me in the, I'm gonna create a forum actually for the quiz to see what kind of result that you have. So come into the, uh, the app after you have done the quiz, let me know how you did it, and let's just talk about aviation. Chill, hang out, watch some aviation news. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time, bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. 
Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.